Welcome everyone to a very special uh, program presented by the Fresno County Public Library and the Fresno Master Gardeners. My name is Laura Fleek. I'm an adult programming librarian with the Fresno County Library. I work out of the Woodward Park branch. I am very, very pleased to present uh, a panel discussion today on tomatoes. So let's get started. I would like to welcome Roz Tampone as our moderator today. Welcome, Roz. Thank you, Laura. Uh, good morning and welcome to the tomato Q&A with the Fresno Master Gardeners. Our panel includes John Duran, class of 2019, Terry Frito, class of 2011, and Gwen Olshave, class of 2015. We'll begin with a short presentation that John has made for us and then we'll open our discussion uh, with questions from the audience. So John, if you're ready, I'll have you begin. Thank you. Thank you everyone and welcome. I'm glad we're doing this virtually because it's really, really hot outside. <laughs> and uh, uh, we appreciate you being with us. Uh, we're by no means experts on tomatoes, but we're here and we have a little bit of experience that we'd like to share with you. I'm going to give you a few slides and just some ideas. Um, I've been a master gardener for a few years. I started growing tomatoes when uh, about 20, 25 years ago. I really started with a small garden and I got involved with special needs students. And we started growing heirloom tomatoes and selling those uh, at the farmer's market. So we kind of experimented and played around with, uh, with some different varieties. I have a couple of pictures here. They're about three or four years old. One on the right side is a, a tomato harvest. There's some peaches mixed in there too. And the one on the left side is actually a big yellow tomato. It's a, over a pound. So that gives you an idea of, uh, of some of the varieties that we use. Um, when you're starting tomatoes, we, I normally, I start my tomatoes in January. I've always started them in January and uh, we transplant in uh, mid-February into quartz. I'll show you a, a picture uh, in a few minutes. And then I transplant again into March. What I do is I transplant them into quartz and then I transplant them into uh, gallons in March. And I'll show you how to do that. Um, tomatoes love heat, but there's not a lot of heat in uh, January, February, and March. So what we do is we kind of trick them a little bit and we put them in black containers and put them in a nice sunny spot. Now, when you purchase tomatoes, if you've gone to the market this year, they're very, very expensive. Uh, they're for over $4 for one uh, little quart tomato plant. But if you buy a seed packet of tomatoes, for example, the Cherokee purples on the left, there were about 80, to, uh, excuse me, I can't see my screen here. There were, there were over 30 tomato seeds in there. Um, Tomato seeds will last in the refrigerator. If you put them in a, in, a, in a cooler or in a jar, they'll last for about three to four years. Uh, but you can, you can start a lot of tomato seeds with one package of, uh, of tomatoes. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple kinds of tomatoes that you may be familiar with. One is an heirloom variety. Heirloom varieties are varieties that have been around for 50 or more years. Um, some of the... Um, the Cherokee purples, the uh, black crims, um, the big rainbows, uh, um, big yellows, those are uh, varieties. There are all kinds of colors and flavor, and the flavors, is, I think the flavor is a lot more intense than a regular hybrid tomato. A hybrid is a tomato that's uh, combined of two varieties. An ace is a hybrid, um, and they're often developed um, so that they are resistant to verticillium wilt, fusarium, or nematodes. Um, you need to try and experiment with different varieties. Uh, I really like the yellows and the dark tomatoes as compared to the red. They're a little sweeter. There's um, a few variety of cherry tomatoes uh, that are, uh, excuse me, that are heirlooms and, and very flavorful. If you don't know what to grow, ask friends and gardeners, ask for their successes and their experiments. You can also contact the UC garden, uh, Master Gardeners. Uh, ask local nurseries. There's a plus and minus to that. They wanna sell you what they have. Um, so you need a reputable nursery that will 
uh, will help you determine uh, and tell you and tell you about the varieties that they have. So don't be afraid to ask for information. Uh, information is is free, and they're willing to share. Whether you like it or not, climate is changing. Uh, you may agree, you may disagree, but we've had some of the hottest days last summer and this summer. Uh, it's it's pretty warm. Know your frost dates if you're going to put tomatoes out early. I plant my tomatoes about April 15th, which is tax day. Now, this year, I don't have a big crop, and I'm wondering if I need to plant those by April 1st. Um, so I'm going to experiment next year and try a little bit earlier. Know your growing zones. Uh, tomato blossoms will not do well uh, with too much nitrogen. The actual the plant will just continue to grow and give you green and green and green. Too much water. Often the complaint is I have all tomato plant but no fruit. And many times what's happening is they're watering too much or it's next to a sprinkler. It's at some place where it's getting water. They need to be stressed when you first plant them. Water them in April, maybe once a week. Stress them out. Your finger is your best um, uh, watering tool, a uh, water measuring tool. You need to stick your finger in the soil. If it's, it's wet an inch or below that, they're fine. They'll do fine. Don't go by the leaves. The leaves are not going to tell you if it's too much water. Now, if they're brown and dead, it's kind of too late. <laughs> too much shade will not let the, uh, the blossom set. And our problem from last summer was the temperature is too high at night. If it's too high at night, the, the fruit will not set. The flowers will not pollinate. So it's got to be uh, below about 75 degrees. Tomatoes need about eight hours of sunlight. The morning light and afternoon shade with this heat is, fairly, is really good. Now, you can't fool Mother Nature, but you can trick her. On the left is a six-pack of my tomato seedlings that I started in January. I'll take those seedlings and I'll peel the bottom leaves off. The root hairs are called trichomes. You can see them in the picture. They're tiny little hairs on the side. If you bury those in that pot, so you pick off all the leaves except the top two or three sets of leaves, and you bury that down in the pot and fill it up with potting soil, all those root hairs will become roots. So I do that twice. These are quartz, and I put them in a nice, warm, sunny spot in February or, or February, March. They love heat. I'll do that again. I'll take the quartz. You can see the quartz that have grown. I'll peel the bottom leaves off, and I'll put them into one-gallon containers, and I'll do the same thing during the month of March. And when I plant my tomatoes in the ground, they're not the little tiny ones that you see in the six-pack. They're the big giant ones that you see on the right. So you're tricking Mother Nature. It's going to give you a quicker bloom and a bigger tomato. Um, and it will help you uh, put them earlier in the, into the soil. Here's another, another picture. When you do plant your tomatoes in the soil, plant them on their side. Uh, all the additional root hairs that you see growing on top of those stems will turn into roots. Now, I put my tomatoes down in the trough. Some people put them up on the, on a mound. I put them in the trough because the water holds better down below. You cannot put your tomatoes in the ground and march and expect them to grow. They need heat to grow. So the top two or three inches are absorbing the heat from the sun. And that's where you want your tomatoes. Remember, in April, water them about once a week. In the summertime, right now, I'm watering almost every day because of the heat. Tomato roots do not go deep. They're pretty shallow. For pest, tomato hornworm is probably your biggest enemy. If you see a big moon, it's called a moon moth flying around at night, that's the tomato hornworm uh, uh, moth. She will lay eggs. Now, if you see little dark spots, little poops on your leaves, you know you've got a tomato hornworm. If your leaves are gone, you know definitely you have a tomato hornworm. Um, the best thing that you, uh, we recommend is use a BT or Bacillus thuringiensis. It is, it's uh, harmful to any type of caterpillar, but it will not harm, harm, excuse me, harm humans. 
the bottom picture is actually a picture of a, a parasite that's put its eggs on a tomato hornworm. And I don't know which moth, well, excuse me, which, uh, um, which, which parasite does that. Uh, I'd have to do some research. Remember, whatever you use, any chemicals that you use on your plants are going to go into the tomato. So make sure you redo your research. Um, you're going to consume chemicals or, or in, insecticides kill good insects and bad insects. And they also be, be ingested by whoever eats the fruit. So please, please do your research. Okay, when planting in April, remember water only once per week, stress the plant so it produces flowers, not plant. Number two, monitor the soil, not the plant. Your finger is your best uh, water meter. I've had people go out and buy water meters that they can stick in the soil, but um, the finger's pretty cheap. And number three, keep <coughs> water consistent. That avoids the cracking, or we call cat face, on, on a tomato plant. A couple of quotes from me. From my experience, remember to choose your battles wisely. Choose the ones that you're going to win. Another thing on tomatoes, and you cannot plant them in the same place year after year after year because they will become uh, disease resistant. The, the diseases will build up in the soil. So you have to rotate your crop every four years or three years. Um, um, so plant them in a different spot. If you have a grow bed divided into three sections, put tomatoes in one section one year, and another section in another year, and a third year in another section. Plant what you're going to eat. Don't be afraid to experiment. If you don't plant something in your garden, Mother Nature will. If the garden is bare, put down some rye seed. I like to put flowers like echinaceas or rubecchias because they have a deep, deep tap root, and those plants will go down. You can also put wheat or rye. Wheat is a good one uh, because it has a deep tap root. And once you, re once you cut it and just mix it in, those roots will decompose into the soil. So if you don't plant something there, Mother Nature will. You can't fool Mother Nature, but you can trick her. Try the little tricks and never give up and enjoy the life in the garden. Okay, Roz. All Hi, Roz. right. Um, I'll just remind everyone that if you have a question, you want to put it in the Q&A box. And then I'm going to go over uh, some of these um, resources that you can use a little bit later on. So John, why don't you go back one, um, why don't you go back to your beginning slide and we'll start an, uh, taking some questions from the, uh, from the audience. Uh, but let me start with uh, John. You've already expressed how long you've been growing tomatoes, which you said were for 25 years, but which ones are your favorite varieties to grow? I, uh, my wife and I went to the San Francisco Home and Garden Show many, many years ago when it was in San Francisco at the Cow Palace. And we did not know what heirlooms were, but there were quite a few varieties there. Um, our best one, the one we first one we bought was a mortgage lifter. It was developed by a guy named Radiator, Radiator Charlie back in the 30s. He had a radiator shop and um, he started selling these tomatoes at a dollar a piece and he paid off his mortgage. So it's called Mortgage Lifter. Another one that I like, is one of the uh, multicolored ones is a rainbow, the big rainbow. Anything dark, the black creme, uh, chocolate cherry. Chocolate cherry is not chocolate flavored. If it was, I'd be a millionaire. I wouldn't be here on this webinar. Uh, but the chocolate cherries are dark ones. And they have a lot, a lot of flavor. Any type of the dark tomatoes. Those are the, my favorites. And Terry, how long have you been growing tomatoes and which ones are your favorites to grow? Well, I've been growing tomatoes since 1961. That was my first tomato plant I planted in a little garden at my parents' home and I got hooked. So I've been growing tomatoes for 61 years. And uh, some years I go a little crazy and I plant upwards of a hundred different tomato plants because I have a big garden because I'm playing with different varieties. And I agree with John that the heirlooms have wonderful flavor, but 
I have a little different take. I like the hybrids because of their good production. And I like producing a lot of tomatoes for canning. Uh, my two favorites are San Marzano, which is an old variety, and a new one that's called Early Resilience. And those, that's a hybrid. And they're very productive and very good and very good on disease resistance. And then Juliet is a small grape-like red tomato that you can eat, you can throw it in salads, you can cook with it. And it's a wonderful sun-dried tomato. And in Fresno, sun-drying is so easy to do. Um, so I really like Juliet. And I'm, one other one that's, a, an, again, it's a hybrid. It's a small cherry. It's called Midnight Snack. And it's a black tomato. And it starts out black growing. And when the bottom turns red, it's ripe. And it's just delicious. So that's another hybrid that I like. And Gwen, how about you? How long have you been growing tomatoes and what's your favorite varieties? Well, Terry beats me. I started in 1973, so it's been almost 50 years for me. Um, and my first batch of tomatoes were mostly bushes that put too much nitrogen in them. Um, and so I learned from that. Um, so uh, my, my favorite, I think, is... Um, I like beefsteak for just a, a regular, um, not hybrid, but heirloom. Um, and uh, the heirloom that I really like, or the um, hybrid that I really like the most is uh, big beef. And I like it because it's big um, and it's very meaty. Um, I've kind of given up on Romas and I didn't have too much success with San Marzano either. So I like the big beef because it's so meaty and I can use it like a, a aroma would be used for paste or salsa or something like that. And this year for the first time I, I grew um, early girls and they seem to be okay, but I don't like their flavor quite as much as I do the big beef. So I, I think I've narrowed it to big beef over the years. Thank you guys. Uh, these are questions <coughs> from our attendees. Um, besides nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, what other micronutrients do you suggest? John, we'll give you the first question. I don't fertilize my, my tomatoes. I put in a compost. I, I, uh, I compost everything from my kitchen. Um, I have uh, uh, soldier flies in my compost, uh, they actually, they're, they're not a pest. They're, they look like a fly, they, but when they pupate, they don't have a mouth. So they live for only a couple of days, but they're voracious and they eat everything. So what I do is I put in compost. Um, I do with my seedlings, I will use uh, liquid fertilizer, just a 10-10-10 fertilizer. But what I do is I mix only half of what's required. So if it's one teaspoon per gallon, I'll put a half a teaspoon because I don't want to burn my tomatoes. I'd rather stress them out a little bit with uh, less, less fertilizer, but most of my uh, feeding is, is compost. Okay, thank you. And Terry, what causes the brown spots on the bottom of the tomato? Well, the most common brown spot I'm thinking they're referring to is um, caused by uneven watering. It's really a calcium deficiency, but it's mediated or created because you're not watering evenly. And quite often that's early on. You can still eat those tomatoes. Um, you just cut that out. They don't look very attractive. Uh, but I do find there are some varieties that are more prone to that. And uh, for example, the Roma, which I used to grow for years, tended to get more blossom end rot than just about uh, any other of the paste varieties. So uh, the easiest thing to do is just make sure you've got a nice watering system. In Fresno, it can get really hot really quick. So you're paying attention. I have mine all on drip and I adjust the timing of the drip depending on the weather. Thank you. And uh, Gwen, uh, John had mentioned regular watering. What does that mean? Well, the watering on the drip system is usually associated with a timer. Um, 
And um, you should also, if you have a drip system and you have your uh, plants in rows, you should also have a um, valve at the end of each row so you could uh, turn off a row that maybe needs to have the water limited. Like if you're growing um, tomatoes at a certain point, uh, some of your tomatoes will start splitting uh, when they've reached their final size and then they get more water than that causes a, a split in them. Um, but the most regular water is from a drip system. And then I wouldn't depend upon that. You're doing it manually. It should be kind of set up with a, some kind of timer mechanism like they have for sprinkler timers and stuff like that. Um, the watering works that way. And, and I would add to what Terry and John said that um, one of the things that helps the tomato, I think from uh, lack of uh, not getting the blossom end rot is to have atom calcium and you can uh, put gypsum, which has some calcium in it, and you can work that in when you're doing your compost and stuff. And a another thing is this mycorrhiza, which is uh, something I usually uh, use when I'm planting tomatoes or any vegetable. It encourages uh, more roots and the more roots you have, the more surface area you have to draw up the uh, minerals and the calcium. It may not really be a problem with your soil. It probably is. It's, it's probably just the, the, the tomato. Usually, even if it starts with a blossom end rot, it will give up that blossom end rot as it grows bigger and bigger. And if you have the mycorrhiza, which encourages more roots, then you're going to have less of a problem. Okay, and uh, thank you, Gwen. John, should you snip your first blooms to promote more growth? There's two types of uh, tomatoes. One's a determinant and one's an indeterminate. Uh, indeterminate are like a vine that just keep growing and growing. So the, the thought is that there are suckers on the side of tomatoes. You can clip those off so you get more growth at top. I've never done that. I've always had uh, a decent production. And uh, if you clip the tops off, sure, it's going to pro produce more on the bottom, but it also reduces the growth of the plant, um, of the, the, the longevity of the plant. Uh, uh, so one thing that you might remember is if you do a large tomato, like a big beef, you're going to get a few tomatoes. They'll be nice. If you do a medium salad type tomato, like uh, um, uh, an early girl or uh, uh, a yellow uh, Juliet, uh, any types of those medium, you're going to get quite a few tomatoes, not a lot, but you get more than the big large ones. The large ones, you get a large production at the start and then they'll slow down. And, but the cherry tomatoes will go all the way into the, uh, into the fall if you take care of them all to the first frost. Um, my daughter-in-law had a cherry tomato that was still producing in January. It was up against the fence and it was a nice warm spot. And it just, that was unbelievable. I, I just, I took pictures of it, but, um, now the, the determinate ones are like a bush tomato. What will happen is you'll get a lot of production and it stops. Um, it just depends on what you want to do and how long you want to do it. John, you were mentioning that your uh, daughter grew tomatoes until January. I think I was harvesting some through February. And um, one of the questions that somebody's gonna ask is about uh, red and green tomatoes. But in January and February, <clears throat> excuse me, I ended up uh, harvesting quite a few green ones and I just put them in those green little baskets that you get tomatoes in. I was eating those through April so yeah, last year was an incredible year. And uh, Terry, they were the Juliet tomatoes that I had. So that was very, very proficient. So the next question is for Terry. Um, we have cherry tomatoes this year and we're getting tiny ones and a regular size like you see in the store. Why is this happening? Any advice to get more consistent size? I think I'm going to pass on that one. <laughs> I'll give that one to Gwen. Uh, I have no idea. Is it my Gwen, do you have an answer to that? 
No, I, I really do not. I don't grow cherry tomatoes because I found most of them are sour. So I'm, I'm anxious to try the Juliet from what Terry said. Um, but I don't have any experience with uh, cherry tomatoes. And John, do you have an answer to that one? I'd have to do more research, but my, my train of thought is uh, the weather, the hot, hot day. We just had some hot, hot days in, in June and we're starting in July. Um, I have the small, small cherry tomatoes and I have the regular size ones on the same plant. So um, I'm not a scientist, but my thought pattern is it has to do with the temperature. Last year, we had a complaint, uh, a lot of complaints about I, my tomatoes not producing any fruit. It was just too hot at night um, because of the 100 plus days, the nights weren't cool enough for the flowers to pollinate said fruit. So that's my wild guess. Well, and you know what? I think last year we had 75 days of over 100 degrees. And hopefully this year we won't have that uh, we're off to a good start, although this week would never uh, prove that. Uh, Terry, this next question is for you. How do you dry your juliets? Oh, I like the question. Um, take a day in July when we're very hot, and usually you're above 100 then. Um, I take old window screens that I you know, wash and have them clean, and I lay them on my kid's old red wagon. I go out and I pick my Juliet's, give them a quick wash. I slice them in half lengthwise and put them cut side up, spread them out individual layer on the screen. Last year in July, it was 105, I think. And I do have black top on my driveway. So I take the wagon out, put the screen on it, take the bowl of cut Juliet's and lay them out cut side up. Bring them in at night. You don't want to feed the squirrels, the possums, the cats, and who knows what all else. So I just wheel that. That's the reason for the wagon. Wheel the wagon into my garage, take it back out the next day. And if they're pretty well drying, flip them. So the other side is down. And I usually get them dried within two days. If it's not quite hot enough, you can leave them for a little longer. Again, bring them in at night. And um, I take them after they're dried and I freeze them. You don't need to, but it keeps the color longer because I'll keep sun-dried tomatoes in the freezer for a year. Thank you, Terry. And the next question is uh, from Adam. Is it bad <coughs> to pick the red tomatoes when they are part red and green? Do you think there's a lack of nutrient if greenish and not full red? When? Is that for me? Yes. Um, um, no, it's not bad to pick it when it's one way or the other like that. Um, uh, you can put the, you can put plain green ones out if you want. I've had a green one just fall off the vine recently. I don't know what happened, but I put it in the kitchen on the counter and um, it's ripening up just fine. It may not taste um, as good as one that had been completely ripe on the vine. Um, but um, I don't see any problem with that. And you can eat completely green tomatoes too. You can find recipes for fried green tomatoes uh, on the web all over the place. And you can choose to uh, eat them either partially, you know, not all fully green or fully green. I've heard from other people who uh, enjoy that sort of thing that um, when it's first getting a blush uh, is the best time to uh, make them into the fried green tomatoes. But no, it's not a problem and, and it will ripen on the counter in the kitchen. Okay, and uh, John, what's the reason our bottom leaves turn brown and crispy, but our top leaves look healthy and green? Again, you're talking about an indeterminate uh, plant. So the top is growing, it continues to grow. Uh, the bottom leaves, are, they're just, have lived their life cycle you can clip them off they don't hurt anything you can leave them but you'll see the top that grows and you're hoping that the top will be producing new flowers that's where your production will come off um, some of these tomatoes that you see that are commercially grown greenhouse tomatoes they're indeterminate varieties 
And if you, if you Google on greenhouse tomatoes, you'll see that uh, they're actually uh, 15, 20 feet tall. Uh, there's nothing on the bottom, but they're, they're producing tomatoes on the top. Okay, thank you. And uh, these were a few questions that came into our helpline uh, this year. Um, Terry, do you have any thoughts on growing tomatoes in containers? Because not everybody has the space to grow a garden, but are there ones that you would recommend and um, how big a container would you need to use for something like that? Well, they have a lot of varieties now that are designed to grow in a container. Um, one that comes to mind is patio. And um, you can also grow cherry tomatoes. You can grow lots of different tomatoes in a container, but I'd go for the ones that tend to be more compact plants, of course. Size of the container, uh, you want to make sure it's pretty good sized. Um, probably nothing smaller than five or 10 gallons. So, you know, those big um, wooden half barrels are excellent. Uh, you can also take a pot within a pot. And we were playing that. One of our master gardeners this year was playing with that at our plant sale. And she took a good five gallon pot, put that five gallon pot inside a bigger pot, and then put compost or humus around in that bigger pot. So the inner pot was planted with a tomato. The outer pot just had insulating humus. And then you keep it watered. And the reason you do that, especially in Fresno, is we are so darn hot. And you've got to protect those plant roots from the really hot days. And yet you want sunshine for the top of the plant. So that's been working really well. It helps conserve water and it helps the plant stay cool at the roots. So all of those are things to consider. And I would look at all the new varieties. They'll, they'll have a whole section um, in the catalogs and such for container plants. And they're coming out some really good ones, different color tomatoes. Uh, I tend to aim to cherries in a pot just because they're very prolific producers. And if all you're gonna have is a pot, I'd, I'd like a lot of little tomatoes. That's my take on it. Okay, thank you. And I and say something on that one, Roz, real quick. Mm -hmm. The large tomatoes do not do well in a pot. Mm -hmm. they, they, you need a smaller variety of tomato, like the cherries or the salad tomatoes, but the large ones will not. You might get one tomato if you get anything at all. So, um, and the determinant size, which are like the bush ones that Terry are talking about, those are the best ones. Okay, thank you. And uh, Gwen? Is full sun needed for growing tomatoes? Well, you need to have six to eight hours of sun. One of the things in our valley, because it's so hot, you can tend to get sunburn. Actually, it's called sun scald on the tomato. And uh, you can protect your tomatoes by um, putting up, they used to sell these at Home Depot and uh, Lowe's, but they have these little patio screen, this mesh thing. Uh, you can get a sheet the length of your tomatoes and, and you just use a little bulldog clip at one end and one at the other, and then you can still lift it up and get underneath to pick your tomatoes, but that'll protect it uh, from the sun, but if, uh, from being burned. But if you have um, you know, a backyard that's completely shady, then uh, you're out of luck in terms of growing vegetables and tomatoes because as it's been stated over and over here, um, you, know, you have to have sun in a minimum six hours, um, but the west sun is the most damaging. So if you can plant it so your tomatoes are protected from the west sun, um, that's the best way to do it. If you have a wood fence or something and you can put it on the, on the west side there, then it gets morning sun and a little bit of sun at noon and then, you know, um, it doesn't have as damaging an effect on uh, the tomato if you have it protected that way. You know, and Gwen, I've used um, some frost cloth for oh. my protection. I, I, my house is uh, under shade um, shade cloth, but to protect those tomatoes, I've just put with clips, I've used some uh, frost cloth, the white frost cloth, and that seems to be working pretty well 
for protecting them. Uh, John, um, how do you prevent the flowers from dropping or not fruiting? Um, like we talked before, there's too, either too much nitrogen or too much fertilizer. It's too hot um, or it's, it's too much water. You won't get any fruit at all. But the biggest problem is the heat. Uh, you just can't, you can't cool it down at night. So uh, you'll get flowers and they'll, they'll drop off or you're watering too much. And the plant says, Oh, I'm happy. I'm going to grow. I'm going to grow. I'm doing what I want. And it won't produce any flowers or any fruit. So um, you'll get a huge, massive five foot green plant with no, no fruiting on it. So check your watering, number one, and uh, there's nothing you can do about the heat at night. Um, Gwen has a good idea if you can put some shade cloth over it, but the temperature at night is still too hot to, um, to allow it to pollinate. Thank you. And this one's from one of our master gardeners. Can you use the same container each year for tomatoes if you add more potting soil or compost? Uh, Terry? Uh, um, boy, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, if you're growing tomatoes year after year in the same place, you're going to build up a whole group of diseases and pests in that soil specifically for tomatoes. So you might be able to get by with it on a con in a container. You're already a smaller and more compact group of soil. So I would dump that out and I'd use that soil somewhere else in my yard where something's not as picky. Um, so I would start with fresh soil. You can mix your own. We can, again, the master gardeners have a recipe for mixing their own soil mix. So it's not so expensive. Um, and I do new every year. I do wanna say one more thing about the sun and the amount of sun that everybody's been talking about. We had an earlier question about pinching back tomato plants. And if you go online, you see a lot of information about pinching back and pruning your plants so it's not so green. And I'll tell you here in Fresno, we're so hot. I, I don't pinch anything back. I let it grow because I want those leaves to protect the plant when it's really hot. It gives you some protection against the really hot days. I get plenty of tomatoes. And um, so I just want to say a lot of the information out there is for areas that are not like ours. And uh, you need to kind of talk to people in your own area about what to do. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Gwen, how do you keep pocket gophers and ground squirrels out of the beds? <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, uh, a cat is a good deterrent. Uh, one of the things I live in the country on uh, acreage and somebody came recently and dropped off this cat. It has a tail about this long. So something happened somewhere to this poor thing. Anyway, uh, we've been feeding it and uh, she's uh, obviously used to being fed twice a day. Um, and we haven't been giving her quite as much food as she probably wants. But so far she's caught eight gophers. Um, and I know that because she leaves the gift of a gopher head all the time at the front door on the carpet, which is now a mess uh, because of, uh, and she chooses to have her meals there sometimes. I heard the squeaking one morning and it was a little baby rabbit. And I don't know if, you know, if people don't look upon rabbits quite the same as, as a gopher, but they could be a pest too. Uh, we have so many rabbits in the country this year. It's in tons of, of ground squirrels and lots of gophers. Um, the best thing for a ground squirrel is the squirrelinator. Um, my cat did not want to eat a dead ground squirrel. We offered it to her, but she wasn't interested in it at all. Um, but the squirrelinator you can get from Tractor Supply Company and there's other things online. Um, and it works very, very well. My husband in the last three days has caught nine ground squirrels using the squirrelinator. Of course, he's got to clean them out at night all the time and he throws them over the fence and, I, and in the morning they're completely gone. So I'm pretty sure the coyotes are getting a good meal out of this. Um, but um, there are products on the market you can get for gophers too. It's kind of a, a U-shaped uh, trap and it works pretty good. It's got a little hole at the end and 
problem is what type of soil you have. Sometimes it's hard to dig that hole. Uh, and then if you have too sandy of a soil, then everything kind of falls in. Um, and uh, sometimes the gopher will take and just stuff that um, hole full of dirt. Um, we found it seems to work best if you put one of those little carrots, like a baby carrot or a regular carrot, the right diameter and stick it in that little hole with the gopher trap. Um, they can smell the carrot. Uh, they also like potatoes, I can tell you, because they, they took bites out of our potatoes. Um, but we did eventually um, get a, go a gopher in the garden, but it is quite the challenge uh, to keep them out. Sometimes it's best to have your garden kind of walled off with some kind of bushes or something so that it's kind of private and it limits the animal access in there. I hope that answered the question. Thank you, Gwen. And this question is directed for Terry, but I think Gwen, you might want to answer it too. And John, you may do this also. I'm uh, not trying to be sexist. Um, is canning <laughs> tomatoes hard to do and how long do they last? So, so this, Terry? Is mine, this is my yes. answer. Um, mm -hmm. I've been canning tomatoes forever. They are one of the uh, vegetables you can can in a water bath. We do have a master gardener, or pardon me, a master food preserver group that's just starting in the Fresno area. And they are more than happy to answer all your questions. Tomatoes today vary a little bit in their acidity. So the newest information from the Department of Ag is that you should add acid to your tomatoes. So that's a little bit of citric acid uh, when you're canning them. And again, don't use recipes from your grandparents. Um, so with that in mind, um, I don't keep my canned tomatoes more than a year and a half. And I say that because um, I'm always wanting to clear out the old before I get the new in there. And sometimes I can a little more than I should. Um, I do like the canning because it doesn't need any refrigeration uh, space or freezer space, which I have limited. Um, so with that in mind, um, is that mine? <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Not one. mine. It's on mute. Um, but um, I would recommend that you talk to the other group, the Master Food Preserver group, and get the straight from the educated, trained mouths. <laughs> Can I, did you add yeah. anything to that? I, I, I've canned for a number of years. Um, and um, what I've been doing lately is because canning, you know, increases the heat in the kitchen and you get a lot of humidity and stuff like that. And so uh, I prefer the method where you uh, freeze tomatoes. Um, and I've, uh, I don't put them in the boiling water and then in the cold water, that's kind of a pain too. Uh, the easiest way to deal with it is just to cut the tomato in half, um, put it on a cookie sheet, um, and of course you're doing a whole batch at once, and put it in a 350 degree oven or even a 200 degree oven for, um, I don't know, 30 minutes or 15, depending upon how hot it is, and then test it and take it out and see if you can peel the skin and if you can peel the skin easily, then you're done. You just peel the skin off and then you put it, you know, you can measure it, put it in a freezer bag, of course, write the date on it and everything. And, and uh, you can keep that at least for a year in the freezer. The hard part is like Terry said, finding room to store it. Um, and it, it works in uh, gallon bags pretty well and you can flatten the gallon bags and pile one on top of the other. And that takes a little bit uh, less of a footprint in, in the freezer or after they're frozen, you can even put them up vertically if you have some kind of bin that you can keep them in. Um, but, um, but canning is not a problem, but you do have to be careful about the acidity because um, the less red a tomato is, the less acid it is, and the less lycopene it has. And so um, that's a problem in terms of canning, but it's not a problem at all for freezing. Um, and I don't recommend you do the boiling in the, in the cold water because that just introduces a bunch of water into your tomato anyway. And you don't want it watery. You want it, you know, to be the natural tomato without any additional water added. So that's why I, I do the freezing method and I've used 
scope has been the most effective for me. Thank you. And I would like to add that when, I, and I still can, I can every summer, but I do it outside on the patio and I have a burner out there and I set it up in the morning. And you know, those spatter guards you use for um, frying on the stove. So mm -hmm. I put the big pot out there, I put the spatter guard on top so I don't get flies, but I can still evaporate out. And I just basically leave it out there all day to cook down when I'm making sauce. Yeah. And, uh, for canning tomatoes, a big propane burner like people use for uh, frying their turkeys. Use that outside and you can you can can outside, it works great. I do not do that inside because it's always in August when we're 110. Right. John, John, I know you can. What about you? I go down to uh, the farmer's market and I buy all their coals for 25 cents a pound and I take them home and can them. Mm -hmm. And they're good. They're good for a year or two years. Um, uh, but I like what you do is the sun dried tomatoes. Those are probably the best. Um, because you can rehydrate those and you can use them on pizza or sauce or different things. So John, you do some canning. I didn't realize that. Yes, I do some canning, some pickling uh, of some items, but uh, um, we haven't in a couple of years because uh, we have access to tomatoes year round. Um, and um, sometimes it's cheaper to buy, <laughs> buy them than can them. Uh, <laughs> my garage is full of jars and, uh, but I can sometimes they're on sale and you can buy a can of tomatoes for a dollar. Uh, whereas you're spending all this heat and time and energy canning. So that's one of those things you choose your battles. Um, and then that's one that I've, I've gone the easy way <laughs> with it. You know, I probably canned 40 years ago uh, when I first moved from New York to California. <clears throat> but I haven't done it in many, many years, but I do like the fresh tomatoes and um, that's what I end up eating. Well, let's see, just a couple more questions. Um, well, can I ask yeah. a question of Terry? You know, mm -hmm. when she described her um, laying out on the screen, how do you mm -hmm. keep the birds from eating it? Don't you have to put a screen on top? Uh, yes, you can do that. I have, uh, I don't have a problem with the birds so much as the neighborhood cats. So I always put a screen on top also. Yeah. Thank you, Glenn. I should have mentioned that. So I have, we, we, years ago, we replaced our, you know, 50 year old windows with the double pane. So I saved all the screens and I just store them up in the garage, up in the rafters. And then I take them down, hose them all off and lay out the screen, put the tomatoes on it, put another screen on top. You're absolutely correct. And then bring the whole thing in though at night because the possums will knock the screen off. <laughs> Roz, I have a comment on the gophers. Yes. Um, I do raised beds and I've had to put uh, chicken wire underneath the bottom of my raised beds to keep the gophers from, from coming underneath. So that's the only way. I haven't been able to trap them. I dug a hole down about two feet and chased it to the neighbor's yard and <laughs> I couldn't find it. So I ended up putting chicken wire under my, my raised beds. And that John, what do you do? John, what do you do for the squirrels, the ground squirrels? You know, you grow extra because you know you're going to lose some. Same with uh, all the fruit in my tree. It's mm -hmm. either ground squirrels or the birds or something. And, and that's one of the battles that you can't, yeah. uh, you can't, you can't relocate your possums. Um, you kind of chase, chase, chase them away or try to get them to the neighbor's yard. <laughs> but um, there's a lot of things that the government will not, allow, will not allow you to do. So you just have to feed a little extra and, put it out where it's away from your garden and, and uh, hopefully that uh, they'll leave your good food. What bothers me is they don't pick one peach. They've got to taste them all. Right. And that's what upsets me the most. Yeah. I had a problem with that earlier and I'm not quite sure if it was a bird that got it or some other rodent that got into my tomatoes, but I end up, I ended up losing about 20 of them and <clears throat> I was really disappointed when you, you know, we knew it was starting to get into the heat of the season and uh, you don't want to lose any if you can help it. Uh, John, this question is for you. Like you said, we should give six to seven hours of sun, but here in California, my tomato and pepper plants leaves start wilting or drying with just two hours of sun. What should I do? 
Check your water, your water, uh, uh, make sure they're watering in the, the hot sunlight. Right now I'm watering mine every day. I, I have mine in raised beds, which require more water. Now for peppers, um, your chili peppers will do okay in the heat, but your bell peppers, they won't produce well until the fall when it starts to cool down. Uh, I do have a bell pepper. It has, gets shade in the afternoon, uh, uh, most afternoons after one o'clock and it's, it's done okay. But uh, I've not had really good success. And if you're going for the colored ones, forget it. Um, they don't do well here. It's, it's just too hot. They need the cool temperatures of the coast where you get the red ones and the yellow ones. Um, but, um, yeah, I would check the water, make sure your water's doing okay. Um, and then again, like Gwen's talked about shade cloth. I think that's our future is, is you're going to have to give a little bit of afternoon shade, or uh, to, it can't be dark shade. It's got to be filtered shade so that they get enough sunlight to grow. And I would add that I used to have a terrible time every year. Now I add a whole lot of compost to my vegetable garden. I don't fertilize, but I add a lot of compost and it's really made a different in my, difference in my peppers because they now have good root systems down there. When I started, I, I'm out on river bottom, so I have lots of sandy soil. So adding the compost every year really helps to hold the moisture. And also the soil is so much better now that the, all the plants get better roots. So that's something I would look to is how good your soil structure is. Is it really got a nice good water holding capacity? Because if it doesn't, you may still need to shade it. And I like Gwen's idea. And I think John's right. That's the way we're going. But if you don't have good soil, it isn't going to get you there. You're right, Terry. And the other thing is to mulch. Mm -hmm. If you mulch, you'll keep the moisture in and you'll keep the weeds out. Um, and that will also uh, soften everything on the bottom and it'll, the root structures, which you have to protect. Mm -hmm. You can grow red peppers, though. Um, if you leave the green bell pepper on the vine, it turns red um, mm -hmm. and gets real, real sweet. So if you're looking for red peppers, just uh, leave the green bell. That's why it's called a green pepper, because it's not really done. Um. John, you mentioned mulching. I just want to add that on October 22nd, um, and we'll be having another Zoom class with um, Tim Sullivan, and he'll be talking about the magic of mulch and how you should be uh, doing that for all your vegetables as well as your other plants. Um, let's see, Terry, this question is for you. Is there a reason tomatoes are peeled to prepare for canning or freezing? Yes. Um, if you notice when you buy canned tomatoes to make tomato sauce, the skin is off of them because um, it, it tends to make a stringy, um, chewy thing in your sauce if that skin is not gone. Um, I have taken an immersion blender and broken that up when I'm making sauce of my own that day with fresh tomatoes, because I don't want to mess with the boiling water. But then you might have to put it through a Foley mill or strain it to get those pieces, stringy pieces of skin out. The skin is not aesthetically pleasing. And uh, so that's that's the only reason. If, if you want to make your tomato sauce with the skin on, you can do that, but you're going to have these stringy bits in it. And so most people don't like that. And the nice, smooth tomato sauce is what most people like. And Gwen, this is a perfect question for you. Do you add salt to the tomatoes when you freeze them? No, I don't add anything to the tomatoes when I freeze them because I don't know what I'm going to be doing. And if you have a fresh grown tomato, you don't really need to add anything to it. It's delicious. I mean, the, the big beef is so sweet. It's unbelievable. And, and I uh, love the combination with the Armenian cucumbers. Here I happen to have one. Uh, and, and tomatoes. Um, and if you, you know, just about equal parts of each with a little salt and pepper, and you don't need anything. 
um, uh, it's, it's delicious. And no, you don't add anything tomatoes when you freeze them or can them. Um, I'd like to add something because I've played around with this the last couple of years is I'll freeze the tomatoes a little differently than Gwen does. I'll pick the whole tomato, put them on a cookie sheet, freeze them whole. Yeah, you can do that. And then when you take them out of the freezer, you run it under the water and that skin just pops right off. And then you put that in to make your sauce or whatever you'd like. You're not going to have a good slicing tomato at that point, but you're going to have good tomato flavor. The difference is Gwen's method will save these freezer space. Mine, I've got the whole tomato, so there's a little more liquid in there. And I do bag them up once they are frozen solid. And those I try to use within three months or so, just because, again, they take up a lot of space in the freezer. I've done that very same thing with peaches. Uh, you could put a whole peach in and, and then, you know, let it freeze overnight and then take it out. Uh, the, instead of doing that boiling water and cold mm -hmm. water and the peach skin comes off. It's just mm -hmm. amazing. It's a lot easier. Well, you know, I'd like to thank all of our audience for asking such incredible questions. Um, you know, and thank you guys for a wonderful uh, presentation. John, thank you for your PowerPoint presentation. And really, thank you for your expert advice on uh, growing tomatoes, the problems with them, the amount of sunshine that they need, and even doing some canning. And um, I know um, our program manager is with us. And uh, Terry, you had mentioned the, um, the master food preservers. That'll be something that we'll talk about maybe at one of our next uh, presentations because it seems like people are very interested in learning how to uh, preserve the foods that they share and they grow. And I have really apologize. I don't know what's going on with my throat this morning, but it's um, certainly not the way I'm hoping it would be. But what I'd like to do right now is share my screen with you and um, let's see if you guys can see this. Are you able to uh, see these things right now? Yeah. Terry, I don't know if you remember, but last year you uh, showed us what you've been doing and that was one day's pick from her tomato, uh, from her garden. And here's some of the freeze dried tomatoes that she's That's done. Thunder. Sun-dried. Sun-dried, excuse me. <laughs> and, um, and Gwen, this was the photo you just sent me of one day's pick of your tomatoes. So just wanted to share that with the group so they knew uh, that we really do have talented tomato growers. And now what I'd like to do is just share a few resources with you. Um, and if you have your camera handy, you may want to take some photos of this, but uh, these are some upcoming classes that we're doing. And Gwen, I'll let you talk just a bit about your cool season veggies that you're doing at Sunnyside Library next week, which will be an in-person class. Okay, you want me to talk now? Please. All right. Okay. Um, well, uh, we're going to uh, have some um, cool season uh, veggies like uh, beets, broccoli, cabbage, kale, carrots, cauliflower, chard, cilantro, lettuce, onions, uh, parsnips, green onions, peas, potatoes, radishes, rutabagas, and spinach are some of the cool season vegetables. And um, I have a little chart that I'll go over with you. Um, and we're talking about uh, improving the soil structure like uh, Terry mentioned. And I'll discuss weeds and uh, watering and uh, other cultural requirements of uh, different vegetables. Um, and I grow um, some of those, but not all of them. And we'll discuss, um, you know, making a plan and keeping a record, which is very important because you can solve a lot of and be proactive in solving your problems 
Um, you remember that old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, and, and if you meet the cultural requirements and do what uh, you should do for whatever uh, vegetable you're growing, um, then you will have much fewer problems. So we'll discuss prevention as well. Uh, it's a long class. It's a two hour class. We try to break a five minute break in between and the room's not real big. So I suggest you arrive uh, as early as you come, can come, um, and, and you can be free to get up and move around. Um, that won't bother me at all. Um, and some people need to move every hour or so. So um, it's a, a good class and it's very um, kind of everything about gardening compiled into one class. And I will go over some of the things like the shade cloth and, um, and we make our own uh, red ant uh, bait. Uh, and we'll talk about other pests and things too. And that's about it. It's a good class. All right, thank you, Gwen. So please join Gwen next Saturday at Sunnyside Library if you're interested in growing some cool season veggies. Um, in August, and actually, some of these classes are already on our website, but uh, in September, uh, we'll have cooking with edible flowers. Um, and at, that'll be at the Woodward Park Library in person. On September 17th, uh, John's gonna be talking about uh, irrigation in the home garden. That'll be at Garden of the Sun. And that's John Kincaid, another one of our master gardeners. On October 1st, I'll be doing a um, how to make a succulent pumpkin. It's a make it take it class. It will be at the GOS and there is a fee of $40 for that. Um, October 15th, I put the wrong class in there. It's not native plants. That one will be on November 16th, I believe. And on October 22nd, I mentioned the magic of mulch. Tim will do a Zoom class on that. And for children on October 29th, they'll be um, decorating mini pumpkins and there'll be a fee of $15. That will be at the GOS. To register for any of the, our Zoom classes, you go to fresnolibcal.com. And uh, just so you know about our Garden of the Sun, it's a, it's a master gardener demonstration garden it's located at 1750 North Winery Avenue, which is between McKinley and Clinton, and it's right adjacent to the Discovery Center. Summer hours are Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 8 to 12, and they close earlier when there's a heat advisory. And if you're interested in becoming a master gardener, the next training class will go from January to April of 2023. There's a tuition fee of $250. There are partial scholarships available. The application started in June. They're due by uh, August 31st. They'll be conducting interviews in September with the selection of Master Gardener trainees in October. And you can find the application on the Master Gardener website. And if you have any gardening questions, uh, if there's any other questions that come up regarding today's class on tomatoes or any other question that you have regarding anything re, um, related to gardening, you can email us at mgfresno at ucdavis.edu or you can visit our website, which is um, on the bottom, and if you'd like to take a picture of this, uh, that way you'll have it handy instead of having to look it up. And just want to thank everyone, uh, thank the panel, um, thank Laura for uh, hosting our Zoom classes, and really want to thank John and Terry and Gwen for their expertise. Um, if you like these Zoom classes and our in-person gardening classes, please write to us at that mgfresno at ucdavis.edu. And at that point, you can also let us know if there are other topics you might be interested in learning. 
So with that, I'll stop the share. Thank everyone again for participating today and um, hope that you enjoyed this. Laura, thank you again. Look forward to our fall classes. And thank you for our wonderful, wonderful guest uh, panelists today, uh, John, Terry, Gwen, and Roz, a fantastic moderator. This is the first time we've done a panel with you all. And I have to say, I really enjoyed it. And I think our attendees did as well. I hope it's something that we can do in the future. Um, I also think tomatoes might be about the only people living around here that truly enjoy the heat. <laughs> uh, but it's really been a fascinating, wonderful program once again. So everyone, please take care. We'll see you all again soon. And thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Roz. Terry, I, I want that chili recipe. <laughs>